We're on 292, we're starting the first Parsha in the second book of the Torah, <coughs> Parsha Shmos. The, the book of Shmos, right, the second book of the Torah, is often referred to as the, the book that, uh, that deals with the creation of the Jewish nation. Up until now, it was the creation of the world and the individuals who, uh, who, on whose shoulders the world rested. And eventually, those people's children become the Jewish nation. And that it's our goal, based on this, that the Jewish nation be created so they can help bring the world to perfection and help the world be a better place. So it starts with the, right, the, the, the world and all of that. And now we get here, we're, begin, we're now discussing the, the, the necessity as to what had to happen to these people before they could actually try to lead the world to a better way. Um, and that is that they have to go through slavery. The purpose of the slavery is to place within the spiritual DNA um, of the Jewish people the ability to sustain suffering, the ability to be sensitive to the pain of others, um, and, and really the ability to uh, become more and more determined to accomplish a positive goal based on the more and more uh, struggle that people put upon us. So the Jewish people, that's why they say sometimes the Jewish people are like an egg. That the more you cook an egg, the harder it gets. The more that a person uh, or the world right, pushes the back against the Jewish people's desire for the world to be moral, the more determined we are in doing it. Right? That's really the, uh, right, the, the basis. So now we begin with the Jewish people entering the land of Egypt, where they will very shortly become slaves. And it says, the Elish Mos B'nei Yisrael HaBayim Mitraima. These are the names of the Jewish people, they weren't even Jewish yet, the children of Israel, children of Jacob, who have come down to Egypt. As Yaakov Ishu Besubo, Yaakov and each of the households of his family came down. And it then says, Reuven, Shimon, Levi, Yehudi, Yisachar, Zulim, Binyam, and Dan, Naphtali, God, Asher. These are all the names of the various households within Yaakov's uh, people. By ye called Nefesh, Yotze, Yerach, Yaakov, Shivim, Nefesh. And there were 70 people who came down. These are all people who came from Yaakov. Yaakov was their father, grandfather, great grandfather. There were 70 of them. By Yosef, Hayabu, Misraim. And Yosef, with his family, were already in Egypt. So there was the 70 who came down, plus the, the immediate family of Yosef, which at this point was four, as far as we know. Um, and that's who entered it. Now, when one goes through what is written in the Parsha previously, you see there's only 69 people who came down to Egypt. But yet, it seems to enumerate later on the 70 people by name. And, there, and you see from this that there is one person who entered Egypt, or let's say one person who was there as they entered Egypt, but was not there as they were about to enter Egypt, right? And, and that was Yocheved, the mo mother of Moshe, who we were told was born as they entered the country. So she didn't leave Israel, but she entered into Egypt, right? That was really the, the first change. Then it, it continues... And Yosef and all of his brothers and that entire generation who came down from Egypt, the original people, they all died. And the Jewish people, it says next, they were fruitful, they multiplied, they became powerful, and they filled the land. Now, the la that means the land of Goshen where they were living. The, the wording here is a bit funny because it doesn't, usually you'd say that the Jewish people were fruitful and multiplied. Right? They were paru v'ravu. But here it says that they were fruitful and they increased using the word vayishritsu. And vayishritsu comes from the word sheretz. Sheretz is an insect. Right? That's what it is. It's an insect or different types of insects. And this particular, uh, that it's referring to means that the Jewish people had children not only were they fruitful, but they had children like an insect might have children. What is that? How does an insect have children? They have a lot of children at one time, right? So from this is where we learn what the statements that we find in the Gutta, that the Jewish people had, had multiple births, 
had maybe as many as six children at a, at a single birth, because they had to go from 70 people, right, to hundreds of thousands that left Israel, I mean, that left Egypt at the, at the end of 240 years, but also there were lots of people who were left behind. So you, it, had to, it could not have been natural, the number of people that were born. It had to be done in a miraculous manner, and that's what it's telling us so far. Then we begin the actual story. It starts on line 8, and it says, Vayakam melech al mitrayim, a new king, it says, took over Egypt, asher lo yada es Yosef, who did not know Yosef. Now here there's a very interesting medrash, um, Rashi quotes it, many commentaries quote it, and says there's two ways of understanding this. One is, there was a, uh, using the quote, there was a new king over Egypt who did not know Yosef. So one commentary says it means literally it was a new king. It was a different house. In other words, you have a house of kings and right, a certain family of kings. They got destroyed, and a new house came in that had no relationship to the first one. Mm-hmm. Right? They were totally different. It was a new type of government comes in. You had this, you know, you have this in, in dynasties in China. You have this in England. Right? Different houses that that come in that take over, and then you have the kings and then right, the queens from a certain household. You had it in Germany, right? Uh, with uh, the kings, the early kings, they, they came in, and there was a certain family, and then they got overthrown, and a new family comes. So they're saying, it's a new king in Egypt who didn't know Yosef, this new king had nothing to do with the old king, had no feeling, no understanding about what happened up until now. He doesn't know Yosef, he doesn't treat Yosef's family any better, because he doesn't know that Yosef, what Yosef did. That's the simple understanding. Now the other commentary tells us something which is remarkable which says is, it's not a new king in reality at all. It's the same king, but he is, he is as kings are, he was fickle. He did what he decided. It's enough already. How long am I going to have gratitude for this Yosef, for this person? Right? You know, it's, he, it's a new policy now. We're changing our mind. Up until now, we had gratitude because this fellow Yosef comes in, saves us from starvation, makes us powerful, makes us wealthy, makes it that Egypt is the most powerful nation in the world, makes it that Egypt has, has food and money right, that no other nation has, makes it that the head of Egypt is the most powerful man in Egypt, which therefore makes him the most powerful man in the world because he owns the people. Right? The people actually sold themselves to him. That's how Yosef set it up so that the king would actually own the people. He wouldn't work for the people like you do in a democracy. He was a king. And as you know, with kings, the, like the treasury of a country, if you're a king, is your personal bank account. You can take money as you want. No one can tell you you have to vote a budget. You do what you want to do. So this, new, um, this king was not new at all. He simply changed his policy. He said, ah, fine, you know, Joseph, what did you do for me lately? I'm not interested. And he changed everything. It says he was the same person, but now he doesn't know who Yosef is. And now trouble begins. Now, what's the difference in the two cases? Like, what do we really care? In both cases, they don't know who Yosef is. The difference is, is teaching us how a person can become, be such an ingrate, how a human being has the ability to totally ignore the amazingly positive and good things that someone does for them. And they can totally destroy it take it away from them, so that, 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 that person has absolutely nothing. Right? That, that, and here Yosef dedicated his life to the kingdom. He dedicated his life to the Pharaoh. He did everything to make sure that Egypt became strong and powerful, and the king just decides that he's ingracious. He's, he doesn't care. Right? It's time, now, uh, I'm the king. I, I, gave you, I gave you long enough. Now it's up to me. And this, on the one hand, shows us the fickleness of monarchy, of governments, but it also shows us a human trait. And the, the human trait of how important it is that the Torah tells us this fact, is telling us to teach us the significance and the imp- real importance of having gratitude, of showing gratitude to people, of letting them know. We're going to see this come up later. There's an amazing story that we're going to come across very soon, as, and you can imagine the stories as follows. Moshe who we haven't even met yet, but I'm going to use some poetic license and take us into the future. Moshe is born within this Parsha, and Moshe is taken into the house of Pharaoh within this Parsha, and it says that Moshe grows up. And then it says he goes out among his people. And you have one story where he goes out, and an Egyptian is beating 
a Hebrew slave, and Moshe feels for him, for the Hebrew slave, and he kills the Egyptian. Right? He kills the Egyptian. Now, this Egyptian right, who he kills works for the government. Moshe has basically put a, a ransom on his own head. Because even though he lives in the king's house, and he's sort of like the king's son, Pharaoh's own son, he was adopted by, the, by Pharaoh's daughter, nevertheless, Pharaoh's own son can't go around killing people who represent the government. Right? That, that's what this person's job was. He was like a policeman, and he went and killed him. So he has to run away. But how do, why does he have to run away? It's because of the next part of the story, which is that at first Moshe looks around, nobody sees him do this, he kills the person, buries them in the sand, end of the story, he's fine. Till the next part of the story is that Moshe is coming out of it, again, coming among the people, and he sees two Jews fighting with each other, two slaves fighting with each other, and he goes over to them and he says, how can you raise your hand against each other? How can you do this? And one of them says to Moshe, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? It says it right in the Torah. And Moses says, and now he, I understand that it's a known fact. Now he has to run away. Right? That's what the Torah tells us, but there's more to it. And the more to it is, who is this person? And the two stories are actually related. The first story is as follows, that the, that the, Egyptian, sla- the Egyptian task master, masters, right, the guys who came in to make the slaves work, had a job to wake up the slaves early in the morning because they had to work 17, 18 hour days, 20 hour days, whatever. And, that, and so they come to wake him up. Well, this, one, this one Egyptian capo comes in and he sees that this Hebrew slave has a very attractive wife. And so he wakes this guy up early and sends him away. And he goes in while it's still dark and pretends to be the husband and has relations with the woman. Right? Now, later, this, this uh, woman right, right, admits to her husband that she was tricked by this Egyptian policeman, right? Like, like it would be like a Nazi shoulder, soldier comes in to yeah. do this. She admits that she's tricked, was tricked by this. So who was that husband? That was a person named Dasan. That was his name, Dasan. When we have the second story, now what happened is, is that, is that in the first part, the, the end of the first part of the story is that the Egyptian finds out that Dawson realizes it, that he was, what he did, and he knows he'll get in trouble because in Egypt you can't, have, you can't you know, take somebody's wife and have relations with someone's wife. You, they couldn't do that. So he decides he's going to beat up this Dawson. He's going to be really cruel to him. So he's beating him up, and Moshe comes out of the castle and sees this, sla- this policeman beating up a Hebrew slave, and Moshe kills him. So Dawson's life was saved by Moshe. Now we go ahead, and Moshe is now walking another day through, and he sees two Hebrew slaves fighting with each other. And the one that he reprimands says to him, oh, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? So how, how, how does that happen? Because it's the same guy. The same guy who Moshe saves his life from being killed by the Egyptian is now telling Moshe, you're going to do that to me too? You're going to kill me like you killed him? In other words, a total, totally showing, in being so ingracious, a, a la- total lack of gratitude, right, to an extreme. The man, Moshe saves his life, and then he goes and rats him out. He tells the, right, the Egyptians that this fellow, right, who you, you, know, who you think he went and, and he sa- I think saved me, he, this fellow went and he goes and, and, um, and killed, the, killed the Egyptian, and then because of it, Moshe had to leave. So here we now have two examples of the idea of a person who doesn't have gratitude. Right, who, who really shows a lack of gratitude. Now, the Torah is showing us these two here in the beginning of the Jewish people to show us the significance and the importance of having gratitude, of how a person needs to act. That, that you know, we, we talk about this a lot. You know, if, um, certainly if someone does something for you, if someone goes out of their way for you, somebody is kind to you, somebody acknowledges you in a way right, that's special, you certainly should show them gratitude. But, you know, the, sometimes the question will come up, people will, will, will tell me, you know, why should I show gratitude to that person? They're just doing their job. Like a mailman delivers your mail. So she, right, the newspaper boy brings the newspaper. Whatever it is, that you, should you show gratitude to them? They're getting paid. The guy cuts your grass. You're paying him to cut your grass. So, so is there a gratitude involved? So most people would say, no, why would they be gratitude? He didn't do anything special for me. But that's not the Jewish idea of gratitude. The Jewish idea of gratitude is that when someone does something good for you, 
or attempts to do something good for you, even if they're paid, you can you should still show them gratitude. Show them that that you appreciate what they did. A person likes to know that even if they're paid, that they did a good job. They like to know you appreciate what they did. A chef likes to know you like the meal, right? Even though you're paying for the meal and he's paying, paying, being paid to do it. The guy who, who you know does your walkway and, and you know gets up at four in the morning to come and shovel your driveway for you, right? Sure, you have to pay him a lot of money, but on the other hand, he did it, right? You paid him because you don't want to do it, and and we should show gratitude. And if he does a good job, you should tell him he does a good job. That's what it's showing us here. And it's showing us the enormous effect of not doing that. The enormous effect is, is that you have this person, Faro, right, who at first doesn't show gratitude to Moshe. And as the Talmud says, a person who does not show gratitude to people will eventually not show gratitude to God. That the good things that people do, eventually you're also not going to see the good things that God does. Here we see Faro, right, no longer having gratitude to Yosef and therefore to the Hebrews. And, tri- and they become slaves now instead of becoming right, part of society. Later on, the same Pharaoh says to Moshe, who is this God you're talking about? What, are you, what do you mean this God of the Hebrews? Right? Up until now, you realize Yosef would talk all about the God of the Hebrews. The God of the Hebrews told me how to understand your dream. The God of the Hebrews told me this is, you're going to have seven years of drought and seven years of of fat, right? Of a, of a lot of of a lot of uh, pro- produce. That's the Jewish God. And then, uh, was, how much later, the same Pharaoh says, "Who is this God? You're telling me God wants his slaves taken out of Egypt? Who is this God? The same guy. Why? Because at first he doesn't acknowledge, right? The good things that people do. Eventually, he won't even acknowledge the good things that God does. That shows you the extent of it. And there's t- uh, these few examples right here that show you. Now. The, here you find an interesting thing. The Pharaoh says at the bottom here, um, right, and ver- verse 8 we says, or verse 9, so he says to his people, Pharaoh says to his people, Behold, the children of Israel are more numerous and stronger than we are. Let us outsmart them before they become numerous, and if there's a war, they're going to join our enemies, and we're going to be thrown out. So what, are they, what does he say? He says, Look around. There's Jews everywhere. He says, You know what's going to happen? We're going to have a war with one of our neighboring countries, and the Jews are going to take the side of our enemy, and they're going to throw Egyptians out of Egypt, and the Jews are going to take over Egypt, right? Classic anti-Semitism is a classic example of what of what we live with throughout history. Is there any reason to think that the Jews are going to do this? Not at all. But the next thing, it's very interesting. I had a um, a friend who was also a great teacher to me, uh, Rabbi Malevsky, and he told me. One of the things he told us is that when he was a rabbi in Mexico, so he's in Mexico City is like an enormous city. It's like the, one of the biggest cities in the world, millions and millions of people. And um, he says that that when he was he was the chief rabbi of Mexico, so he's living in Mexico City, and he says he goes into a cab, right now he was a Spanish speaker. He came from Uruguay, and he, so he Spanish. He asks the cab driver. He says to him, you know, Carlos, how many Jewish people do you think there are? in Mexico City. So he says back, oh, senor, there must be millions of Jewish people in Mexico City. My landlord, he's Jewish. My doctor, he's Jewish. My accountant is Jewish. Right? The man who owns my cab is Jewish. There must be millions of Jews in Mexico City. Right? Now, is he being anti-Semitic? No. But he's got a funny perception because there is like 0.1% of Mexico City is Jewish. Very, very small. It's just that he interacts with many of them because they're in positions of power. They've worked hard, and they became in positions of power. They were blessed, so they, they got these things. So in his mind, everybody with authority over me is Jewish. So there must be so many Jews, right? That's what Pharaoh is doing. Pharaoh is looking out, and he's seeing that you've got Jews in the theater. You have Jews in the government. You have Jews involved here. You have Jews involved there. You have rich Jews. You have all kinds of things going on with the Jewish people. They, there are so many of them that they're going to outsmart us, and they're going to join our enemy. So we have to outsmart them first. And that is what's called, that's classical anti-Semitism. It does not meant either the person doing it is not necessarily malicious. He, but he is misunderstanding what he's seeing. Instead of seeing ten Jews who are there to benefit society and who work hard, 
in order to benefit society and themselves as well, he sees that all of the powerful people, right? The Jews run Hollywood. The Jews run the government. The Jews run banking. The Jews run all of these things, right? If you listen to to how the anti-Semites talk, right, like we wouldn't have to listen to the anti-Semites because the anti-Semites say we run Hollywood. So let's take all the anti-Jewish stuff out of the movies. We can't do it. Right? doesn't work. We run banking. So let's take all of the anti-Semitic countries and anti-Semitic people, and we'll just won't give them any money. It doesn't work, because we don't own banking. We don't own any of those things. Right? We don't have that power. So that's, that's the idea of the classic anti-Semitism that he's exhibiting here. And he says, therefore, we have to go and do something to these Jewish people to stop them. My, we, have, we have the same thing in World War II, even here in, in Canada, with the, with the Asians. They were afraid that the Asians were all working for Japan. So they, put them, they locked them up, just like in America. They locked them up. They, they were law-abiding people, and they put them in camps so that they couldn't go and, and, and have free access because they were afraid of them. Look, there's so many Asians here. They, they, you know what's going to happen. They're going to be they're spies, and they're working with the Japanese against us. So we have to stop them from doing that. When in reality, they, they most likely, we're not spies at all. They were just regular people with mom and pop, you know? And they did that to them. So you see that's, that, that stranger fear that people have is manifest very strongly when it comes to working with Jews. But here we see it as well. But Jews are not thinking about Judaism. Yeah, it, it is, yeah, but it's illogical. Jews educate their children that you get to hard places, and uh, you know, Judaism is where we get to. Yeah, it could be. Now, here we start a new section, beginning on 294 and 295, verse 15. We, we have ju- just read, which I didn't tell you, that, that there was a, a rule that Pharaoh makes a rule. How is he going to deal with the Jews? He's not afraid of the women. We'll marry them. He's afraid of the men. They'll go to war against us and take over our country. So he tells them, all right, any bo- Jewish boys that are born, you have to kill. That's it. Girls are okay, but boys you have to kill. So it says now, the king of Egypt goes to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of the first was Shifra and the name of the second was Pua. And he said, when you deliver the Hebrew women and you see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you are to kill him. If it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and they did not do as the king of Egypt spoke to them and they caused the boys to live. So the king of Egypt calls them and he says, why have you done this thing? Why did you let the boys live? So the Hebrew midwives say to him, because the Hebrew women are unlike the Egyptian women. They are experts. Before the midwife comes to them, they've given birth. Right? So now let's go back and try to understand this story because it's full of holes. First thing is, what do we care what their names were, Shifra and Pua? What do we care? Why does the Torah tell us for eternity the name of these two women? And not only that, but the commentaries and the Talmud says that wasn't even their name. Those were like sort of numb de guerre that they had that the names that they took in order to be not so easy to de- identify, and it really described traits of who they were. They were nicknames, Shifra and Pua. And Rashi explains it, based on the Gemara, that Shifra comes from that she was Misha Ferris. She would, she would uh, clean up the baby, like with a towel, after it was born, because I guess you may know better than I do, but when babies are born, they don't look so good. They, they come out, they're all covered with blood and mucus, so she would take the baby and clean the baby up and sh- and present the baby to the mother. That's, that's why she was called Shifra, because she did that. And Pua, it says, used to try to make the baby have a uh, smile on its face so that the mother should feel endeared to it. So she go poo 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 to the baby, so she was called Pua, she who makes this poo 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 to the baby, and make the baby happy. In both of these instances, they're doing something that is nothing to do with being a midwife. One of them cleans the baby, the other one makes, makes the baby sort of coo and make noises, right? But what's the purpose? The purpose is really because they're, they're trying to endear the baby to the mother, right? So now, that's why they're called these names. So imagine this, why, why is this important? So imagine this following story. Uh, um, you know, a person is, has like collapses in public and they grab him and they rush him to the hospital. They bring him to the hospital. Right? Let's say it's a child, a 10-year-old boy. Comes in, the 10-year-old boy is rushing to the hospital. And as soon as the kid gets in, he's unconscious, the doctors and nurses start working on them. Right? Now, 
The parents are there. They're all worried. What do they do? At best, the doctors and nurses will say, throw them out. Get them out of here. They can't have them in here. That's the best they'll do. Otherwise, they'll just ignore them or push them out. Why? Because they're doing a job. They're trying to save his life, and the parents are standing there crying and worried. We're, our job is to save his life. We need the space. We need the time. We need everything. Right? And they'll save his life. Schiffer and Pua felt that wasn't enough. It was one thing to save the life of this child being born because Pharaoh wants the baby dead. It was a whole other story to now make it so that the mother should be happy to have the baby, that the baby should be clean, should be smiling, should be friendly to the mother, that the mother should have an attraction to the baby. This is going one step beyond. Doctors and nurses, they don't do this. Right? So that's why the Torah tells us about them, because it wasn't enough in their mind to simply save the kids' lives. And we'll see in a minute how they did that. But, but, but they, it was also that they wanted to endear the babies to the mother. The mother is taking a chance here. She, their baby's going to be killed. Right? Very well could be killed. The mother is trying to make it so that doesn't happen. I mean, they're trying to make it that doesn't happen. And beyond that, they're being nice to the mother and to the baby. They're trying to do something extra. Right, which a do- doctors and nurses wouldn't do. And they're not held accountable for not doing it. But amazing how, how far they go when they do it, right? how much they do. So that's really what, why they're known as being so special. Because it wasn't enough that they risked their lives to save these children. They also went out of their way to make sure that the mothers and the babies had an attraction to each other. And that's why they did that. Now, now listen to the rest of the story that we just said. And watch how... how Anybody with a knowledge of birth is going to see that there's something wrong with the story. So, it's, so Faro says to the women, when, you're, when, you, when you go to deliver babies, the midwives deliver babies, right, and you see them on a birth stool, we have to know what that birth stool is, right, and if it's a boy, you have to kill him, and if it's a girl, she shall live. Okay, so what happens is the woman gives birth, if it's a boy, you kill him, if it's a girl, she'll live. Okay, now, so what do they say to him when he says, why didn't you do it? The next time is, why didn't you do it? Why did you let the boys live? And they said, because the women aren't like Egyptians. By the time we get there, the babies are born. So what should Pharaoh say? So kill them. They're born. Kill them. I told you, if it's a boy, you kill him. If it's a girl, she should live. Right? So, well, we couldn't kill him because the babies were born when we got there. And he's going to say, like, what are you, crazy? I just, how are you, I told you if they're boys, you kill them. How are you supposed to know if it's a boy before it's born? Of course it's got to be born first. So if you came and the babies are born because the women are strong, big deal. Kill the babies. You're not doing what I said. You're doing, going directly against what I said. But he accepts the answer. He does. He doesn't argue with them. Because that's because this is not translated correctly. And this is where it is. This word birth stool is not birth stool. It's translated by so many people this way, but the commentaries tell us that, the, that this thing that they're talking about was a device that they used to be able to tell the gender of the baby before the baby was born. The midwives had this, had this wisdom. Right? Midwives have, is an ancient art, and the fact that they might have the ability to use a certain instrument to be able to judge whatever it is they're judging, to be able to tell before the baby is born if it's a boy or a girl, now put that into the story. So it says, Pharaoh says to them, when, the, when you use your instrument to see if it's a boy or a girl before the baby is born, and it's a boy, I want you to abort the fetus. I want you to kill the fetus within the mother. If it's a girl, let the baby be born. And the mother say, say back, well, it's not our fault. When we get there, the baby's born already. Pharaoh is basically saying, I will allow abortion. My, you know, I have the power in my country to, you know, to force abortion, but I'm going to lose control if I tell, if I, imagine if the society hears that I told, told them you have to kill babies, you have to kill born babies, so that the, they'd say that society would revolt against me, but abortions are different. You can have an abortion. It's just, it's, it's like our society's been, right? Abortions are allowed, but you can't go around killing babies. So, Pharaoh says, I can't get away with saying kill the baby. Abort the fetus. And the mothers say, what are we going to do? By the time we got there, the women gave birth already. Right? We can't abort the fetus. The baby's born. So Pharaoh says, oh, okay, so now we have to do a different tactic. Right? That's what he's saying. And that shows you a number of amazing things. First thing is, is that 
is that they, you know, the, the women, the midwives, had these wisdoms. They had knowledge of things that we don't know what they are anymore. But clearly, it, it can't be a birth stool. Have you ever heard of a woman sitting on a stool to give birth? Like, yeah. you never hear something. They lay on their back. They can squat, maybe, and maybe use a stool. But that certainly wasn't the norm. And certainly, what good would it be if the woman's already right, is sitting on the birth stool and the baby's being born? The boy who's born, like what, what, what good is it to try to kill a child who's already born, if you're only supposed to abort them? So you see, the whole story doesn't make sense if you don't translate that word correctly. And now we understand the word; the whole story makes perfect sense because his response back is, "Okay, we're going to have to kill the babies. It's not enough for abortion. I have the power. I'm going to do it. I'm going to tell you now." So now he tells them, "Take the boys and put them in the river. Right? I want them drowned." Because before then, they were dead within the mother. Now they're going to be drowned. And that's, that, that's what the story is telling us. Right? And so then it, it goes on. It says that, that the God benefited the midwives, and the people increased and became very strong. And it was because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. So here it says that the, that the midwives right, put their lives at stake. Right? So because of that, God understood how compassionate they were, how special they were, how extraordinary these women were. So he benefited them. How? It says he gave them houses. The Torah is not telling us that he built a house for them. Like Yocheved, whose daughter was Miriam, who is Shifra and Pua, mm-hmm. clearly had to have a house. Like where would she, her, her husband was the head of the Jews, right? She, right, she had three children, right? not at this point, but she has three children, she has right, Moshe, Miriam, and Aaron. And now she's, and, and, and she needs a house? Like, that's the blessing God gives you? Oh, if you're a very righteous person, I'll build you a house. You never hear about God doing that. Never heard of that before. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the commentary is saying, this doesn't mean a house, like a building. Like, you know, we have, we use the word house in many ways. We have, you have design houses, right? Or designers are. They're not a house. They're not in a house. Yeah, it's called the House of Chanel, the House of Gucci, but it's not. You have also, um, you know, met other examples where a house is something referred to as a house, but it's not mean, it doesn't mean a house, a building that you actually live in, right? Here it's talking about the house, the two special houses that God made for the Jewish people. That was the House of Levi and the House of Kohen. That is, Levi and Kohen are special jobs. They had like a house that they made them unique. Levi's job was to work in the temple and to assist to make sure that everything went well between the Jews and God. And and the Kohen's job is to, is to actually do the work. So it says that Yocheved, she got the house of Kahuna, the house of the Kohen, because Aaron was her son. So from her came Aaron, who was the first, right, who was the first Kohen, and and um, and also from her. Right, came Moshe, who was the king, but he was a Levi. Right? All of them were Levies. Right? Miriam was also a Levi. They were all Levies because their father was a Levi. But from them came the house of Levi and the house of Kohen. And that's why it says that they got that blessing right there. So it says that God made them houses. So it doesn't mean physically. So now Pharaoh says, okay, you guys beat me. Abortions aren't enough. So he says, he commands his entire people, saying, every son that will be born into the river, you should throw him, every daughter you shall keep alive. So now the story is going to go, it's going to, it's going to give you the backstory a little bit now. It's going to switch to a little earlier and then bring us to the future. It says, a man went from the house of Levi, took a daughter of Levi. So here you have a man, or a man from the house of Levi. His name was Amram. Right? And he took a daughter of Levi. So a man who was not a son of Levi, but he was related to Levi, right? he was in his offspring, took a daughter of Levi, who was the direct daughter of Levi. So what we have here is Amram married his aunt, Yocheved. Amram was a grandson of Levi. Yocheved was a daughter of Levi, which, according to the Torah, is forbidden. A man is not allowed to marry his aunt. Right? That's forbidden. The offspring is a mamzer, of a person who does that. The offspring of this union is Moshe. So you would think that Moshe comes from a very questionable sexual background. 
Now, you happen to have this with most of our leaders, our famous leaders, that they do not come from high places. David Amalek was overlooked, King David was overlooked when all of his brothers were, you know, were being evaluated to become the next king. They didn't even bring him to the meeting. They said, for sure, he's not the guy. He's a nobody. He came from questionable background. King Solomon was the offspring of, of David and Bathsheba, which was a questionable background. You have it over and over and over in Jewish history where people come from these. And that's to give us a message, which is, first thing, why it, it wasn't a problem was the Torah wasn't given yet. So the law of you can't marry your aunt wasn't given. It wasn't a law. Right? The Torah is given later. This is before the Torah. So it's like, it would be like, you know, uh, 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 the day before prohibition, right, right, where you can't buy liquor, they arrest somebody for buying liquor. Well, there's nothing wrong with it. It's legal. Maybe tomorrow it's illegal, but today it's legal. I can buy it. Right? You can't arrest me for doing something that will be illegal. So you can't hold them accountable for doing something that will be forbidden. But it's still funny that our greatest leader comes from background like that. And in fact, most of our leaders come from backgrounds like that. And that tells us that w every one of us, regardless of who our family is, how special our family might be um, or not, we have the potential and ability to become great leaders. It really won't, doesn't matter. We don't have to come from a famous family to be a great leader. You just have to be the best you can. They tell the story of one of the great Hasidic Rebbe's. He was the second generation. He was the real closest student of the Baal Shem Tov. He was known as the Magid of Miserich. And it says that the, when the Magid was a young boy, he came home one time from studying, and he found his mother sitting outside the house, and the house had burnt down. And his mother was in tears outside the house. So he goes to his mother. Now, you know, we're talking about the early 1800s. So he goes to his mother, and he tells her, you know, don't worry, it's only belongings, we'll get them, we'll buy everything we need, we'll get another house, we'll get everything, you know, don't worry, we won't be homeless. And the mother says, I'm not worried about the house and the couches and the furniture. In the house was my, my uh, ancestral tree. It showed all of the great rabbis in my family that I came from and was destroyed. I have no proof now of all the great, illustrious people that I come from. So her son says, uh, looks at her and says, you know, um, the, the yichus, right, the family background, will start with me. I'm going to do it again. In other words, he, he's, he's saying this point, which is you don't have to come from a family of Hasidic rebbe's and great scholars and righteous people for you to be a great leader, a great scholar, a righteous person. You have the ability and that's why all of our greatest leaders that we find in history have something that's a little off, a little funny smell to it. Even if they, what it was, they did wasn't really wrong, it's different. And, and it's there to tell you, right, you don't have to be the, the king and the son of a king and the grandson of a king in order to be king. You have, you have to be a good person. You have to do your best. Everybody has that ability. And that's what that message is telling us, that we have that ability ourselves. That's why it, it does that. So now, he goes on. So it says, the woman conceived and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was good. Now, this son is Moshe. Then here's another problem. Moshe is the third child. Third child in this family. So how does a man go and marry his wife and give birth to their third child before the second or first? So the answer is, is that this is not their first marriage. And this is what the Medrash tells us. The Medrash says that Amram who is the man in the story, the father of Moshe, is the head of the Jewish people. They're not called the Jewish people because the Torah is not given yet, but they're the head of the Hebrews. And he sees what's going on, that, that they're killing all the boys, and that we're, 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 going, we're just suffering. Like, we're having children, so the Egyptians kill them. Our children are not going to grow up. We're in, everyone's in pain. Like He said, from now on, no more children. That's it. All men are required to divorce their wives. We're going to, we're, we're, this is not going to work. We have to well, um, disappear. The Jewish people just have to dissipate and disappear. We can't have any more children. So he sends out a message that all men must divorce his wives. And as a Jewish leader is known to do, he will not be in the back of the room. He'll be in the front of the room and he'll do it first. And he divorced his wife. That's what it says. And we're told that his daughter 
because he was married. He had two children at this point. His daughter, Miriam, comes to him and says, Daddy, you are worse than Pharaoh because Pharaoh wants to kill the boys and you want to kill the boys and the girls. And the father listened to his little girl and he realized that he was making a mistake. He was showing a lack of belief and faith in God, that God promised we're going to get through this. So he went and he told all the men, you have to marry your wives again. And when he did that, he said, I have to do it too. I have to show it. So, he, so that's where the story begins. A man goes and marries his aunt, right? And they go and they have a child. They give birth to a son. They saw the son was good. They hid him for three months. They couldn't hide him anymore. So they put him in a wicker basket. They put him into the water. And down he goes, right? That's, of course, the story of Moshe in the basket. That's how the third son is the first one born in the story because it's the second time they were married. They had already had now a girl who was old enough to argue with her father, which is, you know, probably adolescent, and a son, Aaron, who's already alive. Now watch what happens. They go and they send him. So we realize here that in the commentary it says here six-year-old Miriam argued that they were worse than Pharaoh. Yeah. So she was already a midwife with her mother, and no, this the, the story could be doesn't have to be at the at the exact moment. This is a backstory. The story's changed now. Before we we're talking about them being killed. Now we're talking about the man goes and marries his do- his wife again, yeah. right? So it's in the midst of this era, but it's not necessarily the same year. It could be earlier. It could be a little later. By the time they finished it, it had to be at the same time, but not at the beginning. But Nevertheless, what happens then is is that they put him in the basket, they send him down the river, and it says his sister stationed herself at a distance to know what would be done with him. So Miriam, the same one, right, who caused her father to get married, goes and hides at the side of the water to watch her brother, who's going to die. She's going to, her brother's going to drown, and she's watching. And then, of course, Pharaoh's daughter comes down with her maidens, and she saw the basket, Right, and she tells, uh, she goes, she takes it, she opened it, and she saw him, the child. And now watch this part. The child, she saw him, the child, and behold, a youth was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew boys. Now if you look, look and even in the English, the wording is funny, but in Hebrew it's much more obvious. It says that she saw the basket, and then it says, and behold, a youth is crying. The word for youth here is nar. Nar means a young boy. It does not mean a baby. It means like a pre-adolescent boy, an 8-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 6-year-old. He's older than a toddler, but he's, young, but he's, not, he's not bar mitzvah yet. So they can't be, they, well, because the story sounds like they put Moshe in a basket, they're sending him down a river, the baby's crying. They hear Moshe crying, so they go to get him. But the Torah's not telling us that. The Torah's telling us that Miriam hid on the bushes, and Aaron also hid in the bushes. And Aaron was the young boy. And he was crying for his brother. Because he had compassion for his brother who was going to drown. So he was on the side crying. And then, after he cried, it says that God heard him cry and made it so Pharaoh's daughter saw the boy and was able to save him. Not the boy who cried. The boy, now it's the boy in the basket. Now it switches. Because if you, if you learn it literally, it doesn't make sense. You don't call a baby like an, a teenager or a child, like a, a young boy. You call him a baby. So the wording is telling us that message. So what's the purpose of telling us all of this? Like what's the Torah trying to tell us? All right, we have a similar story to this earlier in the Torah. We have the story where Yishmoel and his mother Hagar had been sent out into the desert. A very horrible story that they are sent away and as far as Hagar, the mother, knows, her son is dying. He's, he's in a desert. He's a baby. He's sick. He doesn't have proper food. He doesn't have proper shade. He's dying. So what does she do? It says she takes the baby. She says, I can't handle this. This is too hard for me to watch my baby die. So she takes the baby, puts him under a tree, and she leaves him. And the angel comes and hears his cry and saves him. That's one way of dealing with pain. Then you've got this other way of dealing with pain. You have the sister and the brother come down and feel the pain of their brother and stay there because if their brother's going to die, they're going to be there. They're going to be with him. They're not going to leave him alone. 
You have the, you have Hagar and Yishmoel, where she says, "I can't handle this. This pain of watching my son die is too hard." Understandable, right? it's understandable. So she leaves him. Clearly, for Miriam and for our own young children to see their brother die is a very hard thing, also. But rather than leave him and say, "I'm thinking about my pain," they stay with him and think about his pain, so that they should help him and share his pain with him. And that's showing you a difference between how a, per- a person acts in such a case, where they are actually um, watching someone die, right? Do we care about the pain I'm feeling, right? Which is real pain. I, I being the onlooker, the mother, the child, the sister, right? The, the visitor in the hospital, am I, right? Or am I interested in the pain of the person dying, the person in, in trouble? So in the case with uh, here with Miriam and Aaron, they are clearly concerned about sharing the pain. Carrying, it's in Hebrew, they call it the carrying the yoke of your brother. You're feeling the pain that they're feeling. You feel it also. That idea, right, is it teaches us an important lesson of sharing pain with others. That it's a very important trait for humanity that we as Jews need to teach humanity that you have to share in people's pain. You have, it makes people feel better. To go with someone, that person shouldn't die alone. A person should be in pain alone. A person shouldn't be left alone. You should go, try to be with them. I'm not condemning anyone who hasn't done that, right? And, or somebody who, who can't do it. I'm saying is that this is the trait we should be looking for, to be compassionate to those people in pain, to be there for them. Right? That's what the Torah is telling us here about this story. So now... You see, this whole this whole thing goes on. And she says, now, this is one of the Hebrew boys. So now his sister, Miriam, says to Pharaoh's daughter. So now this Jewish girl is just happened to be standing around, sees Pharaoh's daughter take her brother out of the water. So she's smart. So she says, I'm going to go. And Pharaoh's daughter is not, she's not going to be able to lactate. Right? She's not going to be able to nurse the baby. How's the baby going to live? But my mother, who gave birth to the baby, can. So she says, listen, let me go get you a wet nurse. I'll go get you a nurse to take care of the baby. You're the princess. You're going to mess around with this? So she says, shall I go and summon for you a wet nurse from the Hebrew women who will nurse the boy for you? And she goes to get her own mother, Moshe's mother. Right? Daughter of Pharaoh says, go. And the girl went and summoned the boy's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this boy and nurse him for me, and I'll give you pay. So the woman took the boy and nursed him. The boy grew up. And she brought him to the daughter of Pharaoh, and he was a son to her. She called his name Moshe, as she said, for I drew him from the water. So here, the Moshe's mother takes her own child, takes him home, nurses him, takes care of him. When he's old enough to be weaned from the breast, she brings him back to Pharaoh's daughter, where he's going to now grow up and live in the castle. He's living in the palace of Pharaoh. He is royalty, right? And... Pharaoh's daughter calls him Moses, calls him Moshe. Why? Because I took him from the water. I drew him from the water. Mashi is like Moshe, right? Now, this is an, also an important point. You'll see later on when Moshe is told by God to take the Jews out of uh, Egypt and they have to do the plagues. One of the first plagues you have is the water it turns the blood and you don't and you say you would think what should we do god should tell moshe to turn the water to blood right and then and then pharaoh will listen to you but he doesn't he tells our own turn the water to blood and th- so he'll listen to you why so he listened to moshe well why does he tell Aaron? doesn't tell moshe it says because moshe had gratitude to the water because he was saved from the water and because of that he could not inflict the water in other words, it's symbolic, of course, but it's teaching us another lesson of gratitude, that Moshe could not do something, could not allow himself to do something that would inflict pain on water. All right, we know water doesn't feel pain. They didn't think it felt pain. It's symbolic. It's teaching us a, um, a lesson, right? And that's exactly what, what goes on there. So that's why his name was Moshe. Now, you'll notice it says here in verse 10, the boy grew up. When we turn the page, number 11, 
It happened in those days that Moshe grew up and went out to his brethren. So the Talmud asks, didn't you tell me that already? Just a line ago, you said Moshe grew up. Now you're telling me again he grew up? The Torah doesn't have an extra letter. It doesn't have an extra word. It certainly doesn't have an extra sentence. So why do you tell me two times in two lines that he grew up? He grew up. Okay, fine. So the, the Talmud tells us that the Torah is giving you the answer. The first time Moshe physically grew up, he grew up. He was a baby. He became an adult. He grew up in the house of Pharaoh physically. The second time, we're talking about who he was, not what he was, that he grew up. He matured. He, in Hebrew, when we talk about a great Jewish leader, we call them a gadol. A great one is a big one, big. He's big. But it means great, not big. That's what it means here. Moshe grew up. In one place, he physically grew up. It's true. The second one was Moshe became great. What made Moshe great? He, Moshe, we, we learned this later on, according to some opinion, opinion, Moshe grew up in the house of Pharaoh. Human life was cheap. Anything you wanted, you could have. Moshe very easily could be an arrogant, self-serving, uncaring person, only interested in himself. Without a question, he could do that. Without a question. Right, look at how he was raised. But he didn't. And the first time it tells you he grew up in the house of Pharaoh. The second time it says he grew up and he went out among his brothers and observed their burdens. Because the first time it says physically he grew up in the house of Pharaoh. But emotionally, who was Moshe? Moshe was great. He cared about the pain of his brothers. He went out from the castle and he grew up by going among his brothers. So it's showing you now the second time doesn't mean he physically grew up. It means he became great because he cared about other people's pain. And that's what it's showing you. It said, it happened in those days that Moses grew up and went out to his brethren and observed their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian man striking a Hebrew man of his brethren. He turned in this way and that way and he saw there was no one. And he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Well, I've already told you this story, but that's what it's, it's telling you. Now, Moshe, right, it goes on, the next paragraph says how Moshe does this again, and the person says to him, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? Moshe says, okay, everybody's heard about me, Pharaoh's going to catch me, and he runs away. And, and the next section begins, which we have to stop, but with what happens to Moshe when he runs away, and what goes on in his life. He runs off to Midian. He's living there. There's different opinions as to what his goal was to be in Midian. Why did he want to go to Midian? Um... Did he plan to come back, not plan to come back? Did he thought he was, life was over because the Pharaoh wants to kill him? All of those are worthy of discussion, but we, we, we're not even, can't even get into it. Um, but Mo, at this point, Moshe has now become the, the, really the seed of what will become the greatest Jewish leader in history. Right? He's become the person who, he has royal bearing. He comes from the house of Pharaoh. He was raised with royalty. What other person could you imagine? Can you imagine a son of a slave go out and kill a, a member of the government for, uh, for um, beating up a slave? Can you imagine a son of a slave doing that? Never. But the king's son can do anything he wants. He's royalty. So Moshe right, was raised with the, to understand. Right? He's, he doesn't have to put up with anything. Right? A, a poor person who comes from a slum right, is not going to think of sophistication and of, and of all these ethics and the best way of doing things, while a person who comes from the lap of, of luxury, right, he, things that bother him, that are affecting him, are much different. He knows, I have the power to change this. I can do it. A guy in the slum doesn't know that. Moshe knew, I can change this. I can do it. So because of where he came from. So it was extremely important that Moshe was raised in the house of Pharaoh, but it was equally as important that Moshe became who he was, which was, the, was really a compassionate, caring individual who was prepared to put his entire life on the line to help others. And, and, and that all comes from the fact of what his name was. Because he was saved from the water, he saved others from their problems. 
And that was his whole life, was Moshe doing that. That's what he does all the time. He saves, constantly saving people. That God is mad at the Jews, Moshe goes and fights for him. If somebody is attacking the Jews, Moshe goes and fights them. A Moloch attacks the Jews, he goes and fights for them. The Jews attack the Jews, he goes and fights for them. Whatever it is, it's always Moshe fighting, right? Why? Because Moshe is royalty. And royalty knows I can do anything I want to do. It's a mes good message for us to learn that we can do those things, mm -hmm. just like he did.